Hi, this is the fourth installment in a series of videos about Adrena Bay's cars. While the last video focused on a full-size Segway-like transporter that I called the Harveway, this video will go back and revisit its predecessor, a small N20-based balance bot, and look at upgrading that car from one that ran autonomously to a car that can be operated with a repurposed RC controller. To get there, the first thing needed was a controller. For that, I used an IR transmitter that started life as the control unit for a toy indoor helicopter. Now, the steps taken to decode the data packet sent by this unit could be a whole video unto itself. So, let's save that for another day, and I'll just say that during that exercise, I uncovered a couple of differences in this controller from what you'd find in a conventional RC transmitter. First, regardless of the position of this transmitter's on-off switch, it'll quit sending anything four or five seconds after the throttle is returned to its full down position. So, if you're watching closely, you may notice I'm hitting the throttle for no apparent reason. Often, it's just to ensure that the steering commands are being sent. The second find was that the trim buttons don't affect the transmitted steering signal, but rather the data packet sent contains separate increment decrement flags. In its original application, these flags would change the Healy's onboard speed bias that was applied to its tail fan. So, in this repurposed application, I chose to use these flags as a forward reverse switch. So again, watch and listen closely, and you may see or hear me hitting the trim buttons. But in this case, it's changing the car's direction of travel when the throttle is applied. Next, I added a TSOP 4338 IR receiver to the car. This IC comes packaged in a 3 leaded transistor-style form factor. All that's needed is connect its center lead to ground, one of the outer leads to plus 5 volts, and finally the other outside lead can be connected directly to any of the Leonardo's digital input pins, and at that point it should be good to go. So that part of the upgrade was a snap, and should be noted that that was the one and only physical change made to the car since it was last shown. Now, Exactly which digital pin you choose to use will depend on what other pin commitments are needed to run your project and the method you want to use to extract the data. In my case, since the Leonardo already had a nearly full-time job of keeping the car upright, I chose a pin that could support interrupt-based code to handle reading the controller's data packets. And because most of that code is unique to how this particular controller bundles the data, we'll not do a deep dive into that section of the code. Now, while pursuing this upgrade, two challenges became apparent. First, how to write the code so that it would, so that it would fit within the Leonardo's 32K of programming space, and second, how to weave the controller's travel commands into the PW data stream in such a way that the car doesn't go beyond the capabilities of the N20 drive system. Toward that latter challenge, two new throttle PIDs were added. The first PID operates when non-zero throttle commands are received, and the second comes into play only when there's no throttle signal or when it's zero. So let's look at how the first PID actually works. That is when the throttle command is not zero. The transmitted raw binary data values are linearly scaled to produce a maximum of 58 relative to the balance PID's maximum of 255. This command value is then compared to the current balance PWM and from that the PID generates a complementary change. However, this change isn't applied directly to the PWM value, but 
Rather is used to increment or decrement the set point used by the balance PID during its next calculation. To get this approach to work, the original balance PID was tuned to yield a solid but slightly overdamped response. Now, before continuing on, let's take a look at what's going on on the car's onboard display. It may be hard to make out in this view, but to aid in the analysis of how the code is responding to the changes that the car is experiencing, the display has been up to show the following four pieces of data. Starting in the upper left corner, the operator sees the current average PWM. Remember, that's a value that can range anywhere from minus 255 to plus 255, but typically is something less than plus or minus 80. Then to the right of this is the current RC throttle command. Again, that's a reading that ranges anywhere between plus or minus 58. And now look left on the second line and you'll see what I call the dynamic balance set point. It reads to the hundredth of a degree but without a visible decimal point. By that I mean a value of 125 should be interpreted as one and a quarter degrees. And then to its right is the last data point, the car's static balance point. And like the dynamic balance point is formatted without a decimal point. Now, going back to how the non-zero PID is set up to work. If the average running value, the upper left reading, exactly matches the throttle command, the upper right reading, then the two balance point readings on the second line should be the same. However, if we consider the case where the throttle is calling for more than what the balance PID is generating, then the dynamic balance point is moved forward, which will cause the car to lean forward, and then ultimately the balance PID will have to generate a greater PWM signal to maintain this new attitude. Okay. Now that we've looked at the non-zero PID, let's move to what happens when the throttle is zero or non-existent. The zero PID takes control under these circumstances. It's been optimized to hold the car in one position. But since the car has no wheel encoders, the method it relies on for sensing gross motion is an indirect one. It's basically the same strategy that I described in a previous video and that is the code uses the car's average PWM balance value to estimate its direction and speed of travel. For example, if the average PWM signal is zero and the car's on level ground, then it's assumed that it is in perfect equilibrium and as such is standing still. But if the average is not zero, then this PID will change the dynamic set point much like the non-zero PID did, but with a different set of compensation factors. And in addition to that, it will also periodically update the static set point, something that the non-zero PID never does. If it didn't adjust the static set point and the car was operating on a surface that isn't perfectly level, which is true most of the time, then the car would act as if it had frictionless bearings and begin to drift in the line of travel that would represent a downhill run. But by changing the static set point to lean into the incline, it'll resist this effect and, if applied correctly, will hold the car in place. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video of some value and good luck in your next project.